you positions. Yeah. Can you walk me through that? How do you do that? Well, you know, if you have a piece where it's written for, you know, two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, four French horns, three trumpets, three trombones, and tuba. So that is, you know, eight, you know, that that's about 18 wind players plus strings and then all the other things that happen. So I I would have to take the music written for 18 wind players and get it down to 10. And that means I have to do very creative things with the chords, which notes to leave in, which notes to leave out. Sometimes there are four French horn parts and I only have two horn players and two trumpet players. I'll have the trumpet players play flugelhorn, which is a more mellow instrument. It sounds a little bit like a French horn. So if it's just a French horn passage with four notes, then I, I'll make the two trumpets play flugelhorn and mix it in with the French horns. And it gives the impression that it's, it's still the same sound. But you just don't, you can't start at the top and go, okay, I'm just going to give all this, the, the three and four horn parts to trumpet one and two. You can't do that because they don't always play together and there's different things that happen. So you have to figure out how to put the essential parts in and still keep the character of the piece while you are uh, starting to condense the number of players. So it's, it's, it's kind of a complicated process. With the strings, it's really not that complicated because there are only four string parts, even though there are 12 first violins, they're all playing the same part. So basically you can just say, okay, well, instead of you know 28 strings, we're only gonna use 12. So you're going to have smaller numbers, but all the parts are going to be there. But with when you take two flutes and say, well, now it's only going to be one. Two oboes, well, now it's only, only going to be one. And two clarinets, and there are two bassoons, there's going to be one. So you've taken eight down to five. And then instead of four French horns, you know, three trumpets, four, uh, three trombones, and tuba, so that's 11, you're going to take that down to five as well. Now there's a lot of choices you have to make and and make changes in what they are playing. I'm not rewriting the music, but I am reorchestrating the music. So that it's, it's a very lengthy process. And if you're doing a piece that is something everybody knows, like, you know, dance macabre, you know, which is the the big violin solo. They always play at high uh, Halloween, you know, the Sanson dance macabre. I mean, if you're going to take that piece and condense it, it better be right. <laughs> Everybody knows that piece in the world. So I would say I was, I felt I really needed, it was funny because the Detroit Symphony said we booked Troop Vertigo. And I said, okay, it's a pandemic. What are you going to play? Well, you know, we're going to play this classical music. And I said, how are you going to do that? <laughs> you know, it, There's 39 different parts. You can only have 18 people on stage. How are you going to do it? Well, we, you know, well, we, well, we have these kind of bad arrangements, you know, and when I hear that, you're going to t- put the Detroit Symphony on stage with bad arrangements? Not going to happen. So that's when I said to myself, you know, I think I could figure a very artistic way to reduce this music, to give the impression of the full symphonic music, to make sure all the essential parts are there, but, but condense it down. So I went on this quest, and I spent months doing it, I went into the first rehearsal with this small ensemble in Detroit, and I'm going, oh, my God, you know, these players, I mean, they've they played Dance Macabre like, you know, 90 times in the, in the right version. And they're all in there, and everybody is sort of shell-shocked from the pandemic anyway. And I'm thinking, boy, I don't know. This is going to be interesting how this goes, you know? And we started to play the music, and I saw the musicians smiling. And they were like, wow, we can do this. And this actually sounds good. You know, so it was uh, it was a journey and the music, the musicians ended up really appreciated. Uh, and now since then, what's happened is, there, you know, there are a lot of orchestras that do concerts where they can't take a, the full orchestra. Like maybe they'll like imagine in Rochester, this place is, uh, you know, there's Highland Park, which is this big place in Rochester where they it's a beautiful park. And I think it was designed by Olmsted, the same guy who did uh, Central Park in New York. And they, there's a little stage in there in, in Highland Park, in the Highland Park Bowl. There's this little stage. And sometimes the orchestra will go there and play, and they only can put 20 people on stage. And there's never music for that. Well, guess what? 
Now there is. So a lot of small orchestras are buying this music for summer concerts or these these special events that they do when they can't field the full orchestra. So there is a life for that music beyond the pandemic. So it's turned into a good thing. Your description sounds the equivalent of a musical optical illusion. Is that an appropriate term? Yeah, I would say it's an it's a musical audio illusion. <laughs> yes. Very interesting. And and uh, as you were describing it, another thing popped into my head. You, you were you're working with well known music a lot, but you also done a lot of your own compositions. True. When you're uh, uh, obviously with your own composition, you can adapt it as you as see sit, see fit. I would imagine that there are more limits with something that's well known. It's funny that you say that because. Um... On the Troop Vertigo concert, the music director of the of uh, the artistic director of Troop Vertigo really likes actually some of my original compositions. And one of the ones they were doing was something. Uh, it's called Three Latin Dances, and it's it's a really it's a beautiful piece. It has uh, three dances in it. It has the Cuban Danzón, which is a romantic dance. It has the the Cha Cha, which is a Cuban dance, and it has the Malambo, which is an Argentinian dance. It's a very exciting piece. And I wrote it for a huge orchestra. And when we were going to do the concert in Detroit, she said, well, I, I want to do your three Latin dances. And I said to her, and I thought about it, I said, I don't know if I can, if I can condense that piece. Um, I, there's so many things in it. I, I don't know if I could really make that piece come alive. She said, you, you can, you'll figure it out. So of all the music I did for that concert, that was the hardest. My own piece was the hardest one to actually condense um, just because of of how massive I had made. It, it, it gets pretty big at the end. It's a huge piece. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I just look at music. Um, if I'm going to do anything like reduce something or if, if like, uh, you know, this company Shermer has come to me over the years with Duke Ellington music. Uh, and Ellington didn't write a lot for orchestra. He wrote a few pieces for orchestra, which are, are pretty good. But most of his stuff is written for his big band. And they've said, well, we want you to orchestrate these pieces. We want you to make them work for symphony orchestra. Um, I always feel like if I'm going to do an Ellington Strayhorn piece, like Duke is on one shoulder and Billy's on the other shoulder. And they're watching me work on their music and they're saying, oh, don't do that. That, that, no, no, that's, that's, that's too much Tizik. Just do that. Yeah. That's Ellington, you know? So I always feel like the composer, I imagine they're in the room with me saying, well, that's what I would have done. Uh, and so I try to think of it from their perspective. Like somebody comes to Sanson and says, look, I'll give you 10,000 pounds. If you will perform dance macabre for the King in London, but we only have 18 players. What are you going to do? <laughs> you know. So then I think, okay, uh, there's the project. How can I make this work? So it's always, some things probably can't be reduced. But there are examples, for instance, where uh, there are many composers who have reduced their own music. Uh, so we know it's possible. So I, I just try to do it using all of the education skill and, and things that I've learned over the years of working with orchestras in a way that is, as creative, but as good as it possibly can be to satisfy the listener uh, who has heard the original so many times to make it as real as it can be. And so, so it takes a lot of time to do that and a lot of care and thought and you know, tearing apart a chord. Like, what are the essential notes here? Well, this note is doubled in three places. Well, we only need one person to do that to give the impression. You know, it's all this... It's kind of technical musical stuff, but it, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty deep, actually. It's not easy. Just thinking about the process you're laying out there, uh, the, the only way I can relate up to it really is, um, like, I've worked as a journalist, and I've been out covering the same story as someone else. And I know that when I write about the same thing that someone else is going to write about, it, I'm going to, my lens is different. Therefore, my imprint and my my shape, how I shape the whole the same concept would be different. How do you know when to pull back on the Tizek? Are you are, is it always a conversation with uh, Billy and Duke? 
or or whoever whoever created it before? Um, no, it's it's um, occasionally there. Like for instance, if I I do a uh, uh, a Duke Ellington collection of maybe six or seven different pieces, there are times when I know I'm writing this for a symphony orchestra to play. And it's not going to have a full sax section. It's just going to be kind of a, a more of a Boston pops or a Cincinnati pops sort of treatment of it. Um, I want to keep it as authentic as I can, but I, I, I'm only going to have one saxophone and I'm limited by, you know, orchestral rhythm section players, et cetera. So I'll modify the music to work in that context. Um, and so it's not as authentic as I would like, but it still is very representative of Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn. However, when I'm creating a concert of a, of a new show, like I'm writing, like I have a show that I've written for Shermer called Lush Life. And it is actually all Ellington and Strayhorn. And on that one, I went back and I really, uh, I, I copped exactly what they were doing in the band. So I had full sax section and, you know, and the only thing I, I did on that one that they didn't do, I, you know, we have an amazing string orchestra. So I added strings to it. And the strings are not just fluff, you know, playing, you know, whole notes and sound. I mean, the strings are sometimes playing the saxophone parts because it's so cool when they do that. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, I have an arrangement on this Motown show of uh, Superstition. Yeah. Stevie Wonder? And it's got that. Yeah. And it's got that line in that, 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 that right and the horns are playing that the trumpets and saxes i have the string section going and they can play it and they love it so and i don't think stevie imagines strings would be playing it but i know they can play it and it's exciting you know so i i make those kind of choices you know when uh when i can uh so you know it, it's kind of going back and forth um I don't want to change it too much, but I, I want to, if Stevie gets to hear it, I want to blow his mind and have him say, wow, I never imagined the string orchestra, the cellos are playing that line, you know? I mean, that's that's kind of part of the fun of it. 